Researchers have known for a long time that stress has negative impacts, not just on psychological, but also on physical health as well. Way back in the 1950s, a famous stress researcher, Hans Selye, proposed a theory known as the General Adaptation Syndrome Model. So, Dr. Selye proposed that the stress response system can be characterized as having three distinct phases over time, known as the alarm phase, the resistance phase, and the exhaustion phase. Let's zero in on the first phase, or the alarm phase, which describes what the stress response system is designed to do, help us to cope with emergency short-term changes in our environment. In response to a perceived change in the environment, the stress response system causes the release of two stress-related hormones, cortisol and epinephrine, which together produce a series of changes within the body that mobilize the body's resources for coping with short-term immediate threats. The first of these hormones, epinephrine or adrenaline, initiates a series of changes within the body. For example, an increase in heart rate, an increase in blood pressure, an increase in breathing, an increase in strength, and an increase in the release of sugar from the liver to produce fuel for the muscles. And all of these changes are really terrific if we are running from a tiger that are less helpful when we are sitting in bumper to bumper traffic. And the thing is the stress response system is triggered every time that we feel we are in some trouble, small or large, and this includes all sorts of non-emergency events as well, such as having a fight with your romantic partner. In addition, a second stress-related hormone, cortisol, is also released. Cortisol plays an important role in reducing pain and decreasing inflammation that may occur from injuries following an emergency. Cortisol also acts to help regulate the immune system by decreasing immune response. Now, moving on to the second stage, known as the resistance phase. The release of epinephrine and cortisol can continue for long periods of time in response to long-term stressors. In our modern lives, there are many potential sources of long-term stress, such as a difficult relationship or financial insecurity, a difficult job or an illness in the family. The potential causes are innumerable. The key point here is that during the second phase, resistance, the individual is releasing large quantities of these stress hormones over a prolonged period of time. And the consequence of the longer term release of these chemicals is that the blood pressure is constantly elevated, the heart rate is constantly elevated, muscle tension is also elevated, blood sugar levels are irregular, and the immune system is suppressed. Now the human body can cope with these altered metabolic function for some time, weeks, months, years, decades even. But eventually, the human body can no longer cope with these elevated metabolic rates, and we now begin to enter the final phase of the stress response model, the exhaustion phase, as the body can no longer cope with the elevated metabolic functions brought on by long-term stress. The outcome during the exhaustion phase now is disease, as different organs and functions of the body become impaired due to the long-term effects of epinephrine and cortisol. And these effects can be varied and really depend on the individual and their individual susceptibility. So the heart and circulatory system, for example, can become damaged from constant elevation, which leads to heart disease, potentially heart attacks, strokes, and even death. The individual can develop diabetes from long-term dysregulation of sugar and back and neck problems from elevated muscle tension. And the long-term suppression of the immune system by cortisol can lead to the development of all sorts of infectious diseases, such as influenza and worse, and even non-infectious diseases, such as cancer, which can lead to, of course, a premature death. So stress itself can kill. Mm -hmm.